You're going to have to get on up for Chadwick Boseman. That's right. That's it always works, boy. <laughs> Some of you may know the work of Japanese doctor Masaru Emoto, who performed experiments on glasses of water. He placed words, thoughts, names on the glasses of water and then froze them and then through microscopic photography he observed the aesthetic crystallization of the water and what he found was can you hear me i want to make sure you can hear me yeah. what he found was the crystals turn into shapes that look like flowers look like jewels look like snowflakes when positive words were said over the water when words like love beauty joy mother Teresa and it's important to remember that it's names the water crystals turned into beautiful shapes but in contrast when words like hate, envy, jealousy, and Adolf Hitler were said over the water, placed over the water, the crystallization turned into erratic, ugly shapes that seemed like tumors, seemed like scars, seemed like scabs. Now this idea of Speaking over the water is nothing new. We all know it from the Bible. When it says that in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And the earth was without form and void and darkness was over the face of the deep. And God said over the deep, let there be light. And there was light. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing us to come here and celebrate you. Celebrate our journey celebrate our struggle celebrate what you have made us into through that struggle thank you for the heroes that you have brought into our lineage into our legacy thank you for the heroes that are here tonight thank you for what we have done in the past and thank you for what you have in store for us i ask lord that you use me use my mouth i ask that you use my body i ask that you use uh my artistry I ask that you open the ears of the people that are within my voice and that they receive what you have for, for them tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Your son, Yeshua. Amen. As many of you know, Reginald Hudlin and I will soon release the film Marshall, which chronicles... Chronicles a single court case argued by civil rights attorney Sam Friedman and Thurgood Marshall. Some of you saw the film last night. Now we're counting on the rest of you to see it in the near future. In all this musing over the greatness of Justice Marshall, one word comes to mind. Conviction. Not a conviction defined as the court's guilty verdict against the defendant, but conviction defined as a firmly held belief or opinion. Matthew 22 and 14 gives further insight into the word with this mysterious verse. Many are called, but few are chosen. The call or the need for action goes out to all ears and range of the sound, but it is only the chosen who hear the inward call who have the inward conviction to take action, to do what's needed. 
the chosen listen to their inward call and so move. As African Americans, we have a special affinity for those who are convicted to be the first of our kind to do something, and rightfully so. After nearly 400 years of slavery, where the opportunities for social, political, and economic advancement were unavailable to us, being the first of our race to make a particular achievement is a landmark of sorts. Measuring the distance from our emancipation from slavery to the new victory. It is part of our historical dialogue to celebrate first, to be the first to integrate a school or a job, the first to cross the color barrier into Major League Baseball, the first Supreme Court justice. These landmarks are like altars built by the Old Testament prophets who sought to remember what the Lord had done in a particular place. But not only are these first countable moments in our experience as African Americans, but they are also measurements of how far the nation has come. Americans of all races seem to celebrate our first because they either define how progressive the status quo has become or it opens a new level of possibility for others that are considered minorities. When, pre when President Barack Obama was elected during his first term, there were celebrations in the streets. In fact, celebrations went up around the world because the ideals of this United States realized are a beacon around the globe. Cries of joy went up because our plight as Africans in the Americas and our triumphs exhibit both the best and the worst of this nation. We are the light by which the nation sees herself because we fasten her firmly to her promises. We now live in a strange time. Money and big business have a louder voice than truth. We crave attention more than we thirst for justice. We seek fame or to make a name of ourselves more than we search for life that has meaning. We live in an age when politicians will put their allegiance to party lines over the health of tens of millions of Americans. If there was ever a time when we need the spirit of conviction, one like that of Thurgood Marshall, it is now. There are no stories more American than Thurgood Marshall's story. If there was a face to add to Mount Rushmore, it would be his. Because although the founders of our nation established his creed, it was Thurgood Marshall that forced the nation to live up to it. Although his achievements deserve, deserve to be carved in the annals, we can no longer afford to place our heroes on a pedestal. We can no longer afford to define our heroes by their highlight reel, all makes, no misses, ESPN. There is a danger in this type of study of history. It is a revisionist history that worships our heroes and prevents us from learning the most we can from their stories. Because as humans, we always learn more from our failures than we do from our successes. I'm not saying that we should not canonize our greats, but we have to bring them down to earth so they can be looked at in a realistic way so that more young minds can make the easy realization that, that the same greatness is within them. There is no legend more down to earth than Thurgood Marshall. Early on in, in his life, he wasn't particularly engaged as a student. During his freshman year at Lincoln, he let his campus life still focus from his studies. He joined a fraternity. He drank. He smoked. He was like you. He was like me. <laughs> but later, and especially at Howard University, he found the thing that would engage his genius and his focus, the law, and the use of the law to improve the lives of his people. There may be some geniuses out there who are not currently making good grades. You can't judge everything from grades. Our heroes don't have to be perfect. 
We can't place our heroes at such an unreachable height that we fail to recognize the heroes of the present when they come. We can't expect them to be polished and perfect when they arrive. In fact, it's better for them to be rough around the edges. It's better for them to not sound like you expect or look like you expect. Marshall used his way with words and his way with people to persuade and captivate and inspire. So don't try to change our young leaders when they are convicted to emerge. Let them come as they are, with braids, nappy, straight, white, queer, half white, dark, whatever they may be. If you want new life, if you want new life in our activism, if you want new life in our organization, and if this is truly the, the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, then get out of the way and let their genius present itself. What's most important, what's most important is that they have convictions that line up with the core ideals of the organization, that they become strong enough and rooted enough to fight. The spirit and the attributes of Thurgood Marshall have inspired many from all walks of life. Sherilyn Phil the NAACP Legal Defense and Education Fund, Kristen Clark, Lawyers Committee for Civil Rights Under Law, Kim Fox, Cook Counties, State's Attorney in Chicago. The talent is certainly present. The energy and conviction are present. The refusal to take no for an answer is present. Yet, the organization, and don't get mad at me for saying this, still craves the youthful energy and drive for today's impact. When I look at the Thurgood Marshall, with Thurgood Marshall's record, arguing cases before the Supreme Court, he won 29 of 32 cases. That's like Michael Jordan. Somebody else said it's like Bill Russell. It's better than that. That's like Floyd Mayweather never getting beat. That's like Marky, Rocky Marciano, 50 and 0. We're talking about the highest court in the land and the strategy of it to lose in order to win. He had to lose on the lower courts to take because he was dealing with racist ideology. He was in small towns where grand wizards were the judges. He had to have the courage to go in those spaces and lose, and lose, and lose, and lose until he got his cases to the Supreme Court where precedent, precedents could be set. There's a lesson in that, to know how to lose in order to win. He was known as the Joe Lewis of the courtroom. Imagine hearing about each one of those victories. It's not history. Take yourself back to the time. Imagine hearing about it during that time and realizing that your sense of freedom, justice, and equality have been increased with that win. These are not things that you would take for granted. The impact is real to you, present to you. Imagine hearing about the victory and wanting to be a part of the organization then, wanting to be a part of the triumph. We have to ask ourselves the question, if Charles Hamilton, Houston, and Walter White had not picked a fight against segregation, would Thurgood, would Thurgood Marshall, as we know him, have risen out of the fray? Are great heroes not created from formidable adversaries? Warriors arise out of confrontation. Was it not the celebration of those wins that galvanized this organization and inspired its funding? So what are the new victories of this time? Don't we need victories in Chicago? I mean, what is the alternative for our youth to continue to kill one another? That is an unacceptable answer. One of the key elements of Thurgood Marshall's journey as a civil rights attorney is that he was able to galvanize through his personality the greatest minds, get them all in the room 
and get them to work together. He could play to their egos or get them to put their egos aside. Whatever it takes, is that not the move that must be made? He was aggressive with his fight for justice. Yes, at times he acted as a defense attorney, but Thurgood Marshall didn't just play defense. He went around picking fights against injustice, searching out ways that the spirit of the law can better serve the people. He was offensive in his practice. If you truly want to galvanize a youthful energy in the organization and in the activism, that is the, the approach that it will take. This is a hip hop generation. Young people don't want to just talk about the days of old and the, the greats of old. If there is change to be made right now, they, they want to make a difference right now. The youthful spirit is adventurous, fearless. There are fights to pick, problems to solve all over this nation. There must be clean water to drink. There must be suitable schools to educate our kids. There must be health care for the sick. No matter how long it's, it's been below the standard in place, if you pick that fight, like Thurgood Marshall, you have to win. These are pivotal days. We cannot afford to be silent and stagnant when such significant decisions about the lives of all Americans are hanging in the balance. Heroes must show up in droves. Change must be issued in mass. I want to leave you by highlighting two warriors of conviction. State's Attorney Marilyn Mosby. Baltimore's own who dared to prosecute officers who undoubtedly use unnecessary lethal force when arresting the late Freddie Gray. They severed 80% of his spine and damaged his voice box. Now, I don't know what kind of normal arrest that is. In a, in a nation that almost never holds police officers accountable enough to take investigations outside the hands of other law enforcement officials, that almost never indicts police officers in cases of police brutality. Mosby was brave enough to seek justice. And, and in addition to that, I want to highlight Dr. Mona Anna Atisha, the pediatrician who detected high levels of lead in babies that were brought to her care until Dr. Atisha's actions, the citizens of Flint complained about the water only to have city officials tell them that the dark water was fine. Now, as I started talking about the water, she realized that she had to do more than just talk over the water. Her convictions led her to blow the whistle on the city, saving thousands of lives and preserving the minds and bodies of our children. So conviction, conviction. And in my opinion, this was Justice Marshall's core strength. He believed in the core values of this nation. He believed that the common man should have the same rights as the affluent and the rich. The common man should have the same health care as our president or a congressman or a senator. The same opportunity to discover fatal illness before it kills them and the ability to treat it and survive. Thank you and may, may God bless you and keep you.